The reality is when we look at the theme of this series, Jesus, Lord of all, every single time we proclaim that truth, we are confronted with a truth from God's word that is not, has not only always been true, it not only is true now, but it will be true for all of eternity. Not everyone knows that or acknowledges that at this time. Many people throughout history, millions and billions even, have not acknowledged that throughout all of human history as we have known it. But there will come a day in which every eye will see him and every tongue will confess that he's Lord and every knee will bow to him and confess him as Lord. And, and the reality is that today we have an opportunity to focus not only on who he is and his lordship, but to respond to that long before it is something that will be required of every human. Long before every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, today we can willingly, out of hearts that love God, come to Jesus and bow our knees and confess with our tongues that he is Lord. And last week, if you remember, we looked at the image of God in Jesus and how Jesus was that, that perfect image of God. And today, it propels us into the next step in Colossians chapter 2, where we're looking at this thing called the fullness of God and what that's really all about. Uh, we have handouts for you today uh, throughout this entire series we do. Our notes are online at notes.wearegateway.ca, and we also have a YouVersion Live event, which you can uh, look up on your smart devices that you can see there. Uh, as you can follow along with the notes that we have today. But we are going to begin this morning by, by taking a look at Colossians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles or you have uh, your, um, the scriptures on your smart device or in our YouVersion Live event, have a look there with me starting at the very first verse of Colossians 2. Let's take a look at this thing called the fullness of God. He says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. Let's skip over a couple verses. He says that your hearts may be encouraged, being united in love, and that you may have all the riches of the full assurance of understanding in order that you may fully know the mystery of God the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how steadfast your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, being rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing in it with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on the human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness, everyone say, all the fullness, all the fullness of the Godhead lives bodily, and in Christ you are brought to fullness. Let's say brought to fullness. It says he is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. By putting off the body of sinful flesh in the circumcision of Christ, you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ, forgiving all your sins and blotting out the handwriting of decrees which was against us and opposed to us. He has taken it away and nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. Thank God for the power and the truth of his word today. Amen? And we're going to look at this concept called fullness. It's an amazing word. I had you say a couple phrases in the middle of that scripture that, that, that talked about fullness. And if you take a, a real good hard look at the word fullness and you see its use throughout scripture, you will see that the word fullness means richness, completeness, comprehensiveness, detail, breadth, abundance, ampleness, roundness, plumpness. Now, you may not all want to answer this question. If you don't want to, that's okay. You don't have to participate. 
But how many of you would say that you'd like to lose some weight? All right, you, don't, you can just participate only if you want to, okay? Some of you are proudly, yeah, that's me, yeah. I want everybody to know. All right, well, uh, my hand was up. I, I see you saw that, but if you want to shed some of your plumpness, it's good to confess that today. Well, as I was thinking about it this past week and, and thinking about what these words mean, I found it kind of amazing and interesting, and I've also experienced this firsthand, <laughs> that if you eat a lot of every meal until you're full, full, it will likely lead to you being plump, or as we like to call it, full-figured, right? You know what I mean? So being full leads to being full, you know? Fullness leads to fullness. <laughs> and, and it's amazing how what is true physically is also true spiritually. The more you eat, the fuller you get, right? And the fullness of God is really at the heart of this scripture today. It's also at the heart of a beautiful Hebrew word, shalom, which speaks of peace and completeness and wholeness, prosperity, welfare, well-being, and safety. That's really what fullness is about. That's really what shalom is about. They are related to one another. And today I have 10 truths. Everybody say 10 truths. I have 10 truths to give you from this rich passage of scripture in which the Lord shares with us the life-changing principles of fullness. All 10 of these things are about fullness. Four of them are specifically about God's fullness in Jesus, and, four, and six of them are about God's fullness in us. They're related to each other. The fullness of God is something that Jesus experienced in every way. The fullness of God is also something that we can experience in every way in Christ. Now I want to ask you a question. What is the opposite of fullness? Somebody tell put up your hand and tell me. Yep. Emptiness? Emptiness? Someone else. What's opposite to fullness? Come on. Good. Emptiness? What else? Say it again. Void. Someone else. Lack, yep. Hunger, yep. Starvation. Were you going to say the same thing? Or something different? No, I was going to say. Sorry, I forgot. Oh, that's okay. Your husband made you forget. That's good. Need. See, the picture that you are painting with your words is something that many, many, Many people experience on a regular basis, do they not? Some people who call themselves Christians experience those things too. Now I want to ask you a question. If the fullness of God that is in Christ dwells in you, is there any reason you should experience emptiness or void or starvation spiritually? Is there? You don't need to be. You do not need to have leanness or barrenness or hollowness or purposelessness or shallowness or a void or emptiness or lack in your life. You do not need to. The fullness of God is something that is for us. So I want to ask you today, are you experiencing lack or emptiness or shallowness or hollowness in any area of your life? Is it possible that something is lacking and you're not necessarily aware of what it is? Maybe God wants to speak to you about that today. He wants you to experience his fullness, his wholeness, his richness, his abundance, his plumpness, his shalom, just as Jesus experienced the shalom of God. So in spite of what you've heard, it's good to be spiritually plump. Turn to the person beside you and say, I don't care what you've heard, I want to be plump. Okay? <laughs> oh, man. A lot of confession going on here today. Yes, finally I admit it, I want to be plump. I'm tired of living in guilt, all right? Now, we're spiritually speaking, okay? Spiritually. But here's the reality is we live in a world today that really, really pushes hard to be as thin 
skinny as possible. We need to be healthy. We need to have a healthy lifestyle. And I believe that the healthier lifestyle we have physically, the less plumpness or over plumpness we will have. The reality is this though, spiritually, it's not quite that way. Spiritually, I believe that God wants you to be fit, but I do not believe that he wants you to have lack. Spiritually speaking, we do not need to be starving ourselves. We need to be rich and full and, full and plump with the, with the fullness of God, all right? So let's get into it. Let's take a look, first of all, at God's fullness in Jesus. The first thing that Paul gets into here in verse three is this, that all wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. That's quite a statement. All wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. In verse three, he says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I was reminded of a couple of uh, Old Testament scriptures from, from Proverbs and Psalms, which say this. Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Psalm 14 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And the word fool there denotes someone who is morally deficient. If all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ, and fools despise wisdom, and those who deny God are fools, then those who reject or despise Christ are also foolish. They are rejecting real wisdom and real knowledge without even knowing that that's what they're rejecting. You see, this is not talking about human intelligence or brain capacity. There are a lot of smart people who don't know God. There are a lot of very intelligent people, humanly speaking, that do not have the knowledge of the Holy One, of Jesus. But the scripture is clear here that human knowledge and understanding ultimately does not matter if we do not know Christ. Now think about this for a minute. You can know all of the things in the world that, and have a dizzying intellect above everyone else and still lose your soul for eternity. So I want to ask you, the moment you pass from this life into the next, does it matter what you all know if you don't know him? It's not an issue of human capacity or intelligence. Real knowledge, real wisdom, and real understanding, at least according to the scripture, that lasts forever beyond this life into eternity, starts with knowing God and his son, Jesus Christ. And that is why a child can have this kind of knowledge and understanding, by knowing Jesus. Children don't struggle with this as much as we do. We grow up and then we start analyzing everything and our brains get in the way and many times they start interfering with the simple childlike faith that God is looking for us to have and that's the key to really having knowledge and understanding, not being smart or having a dizzying intellect. In 1 Corinthians chapter two, Paul says, we speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So I wanna encourage you today to know that spiritual discernment is something that God wants to bring to every one of us and it comes through Christ. Secondly, all the fullness of God is in Christ. There's that word fullness again. In verse nine, he says, in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead, your version might say of the deity or of God, lives bodily in Christ. Now remember the meaning of the word fullness. Remember everything that it encompasses and all the other words that we use to describe it. So the question is, what does it imply when it says, in Christ, the fullness of God dwells or lives? Think about it this way. Everything true about God, his nature, his character, his holiness, his attributes, his love, his faithfulness, his compassion, his thoughts, his words, his actions are all true about Christ. That means all the richness and completeness and comprehensiveness and detail and breadth and abundance and ampleness of God are in Jesus Christ. It means all the peace and wholeness and prosperity and well-being and shalom of God are in Jesus Christ. It means that everything you could ever need or want from God, you find in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that today? then why do you search elsewhere? 
even if you are a believer, even if you know Jesus, are there times in which you don't truly believe that everything you could ever need or want, you find only in Christ? The sense of purpose and meaning and destiny comes from him. What did Jesus say? John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. If you're looking for meaning through God, look to Jesus. Thirdly, Christ is master over all. It says in verse 10, he is the head over every power and authority. Right in the middle of this discourse that Paul's giving about the fullness of God being in Jesus and the fullness that we can have in him, Paul makes this statement about Christ being master and head over all. And he uses the word power and authority. The, the word power literally refers to principality. It's like a ruling, a territory, a domain of a ruler. Now I want to ask you a question today. What are some powers and principalities and authorities that you think Paul might be referring to here? Just throw out some words to me. What do you think? Help me. What are some powers, principalities, authorities that he's talking about here? Someone. Okay. An, em an earthly empire. What else? What else is he referring to? What do you think? Someone help me. Come on. This is an interactive Bible study. That means you get to interact, okay? What was that? Okay, like greed being, you mean like a, a human tendency, a sinful human tendency. Good, that's good. Someone else? Demons. D demonic evil powers. How many of you know that there is such a thing? Right? It doesn't matter whether it seems rational to you. The scripture is very clear about forces of both good and evil that exist in the spiritual heavenly realms. All right. Someone else. Media. Wow. The influence and the power of media. You see the different directions that you're going here? I love that. Do you know why? It's because the hint that he gives us in that scripture is in the word every, which means all. Think about that. No matter what you think of, all power, all principalities, all authorities, Jesus is the head, the master of. So no matter what you think of, whether it's an earthly thing, whether it's spiritual, or whether it's like uh, an empire in the world, or a physical ruler, or whether it's a sin that we might struggle with, Jesus is master over every power, principality, and authority. That means spiritually, both good and evil. It means physically, that is human powers. It means nature and natural powers. See, Jesus is master over every spiritual principality that would ever seek to tear down and ruin or destroy your faith and your life. How many of you know that the enemy wants to kill you? And any spiritual principality that wants to tear you down, you need to be encouraged and reminded of today, Jesus is master over those powers and authorities. Jesus is master over every physical power that seeks to govern and rule in this world and reign and dominate or oppress on this earth. He is Lord over anyone even today in North Korea that would want to push that button and launch destructive missiles, right? Jesus is master. Jesus is also master over nature, the weather, the elements, the functions and operations of everything he created. I'm a motorcycle rider. At least I used to be before the weather got really crappy. And um, I've been complaining a lot about the weather. Anybody else confess that today? I've been complaining about the weather. You know why? Because I've been really spoiled the last few years. I have um, been riding before March is even out every year. This year, I'm hoping I might be able to get on my bike by June. You know what I mean? It's just been quite a spring, right? It's been so cold and miserable and wet, and I've been complaining. And you know what? God's been convicting, about, convicting me about that this week. And I was reminded from this scripture as I was, don't you hate that, Pastor Rick? You're preparing a sermon, and then God starts convicting you with it. I hate that. I wish I could just say it, and none of it applies to me. You know what I mean? Ugh. We're going to have to talk to God about that when we get up there, but I'm sure that's going to go really well with him. <laughs> But think about this, I've been complaining, God's convicting me of this and saying, Tim, I'm master over the weather you're complaining about. So it would sort of like be, it would be, be like someone coming here and complaining about the music at Gateway Church. 
The reality is, is this. I may be in charge of that, but Pastor Rick is the master of Gateway Church. So when, when you complain about that, you're complaining to him, all right, or about him. You're complaining about what he has implemented and put in place. So if you want him to get rid of me, you're going to have to go to him. Don't come to me, all right? I don't care, right? I'm kidding. The reality is this. When I complain about the weather, I'm complaining about the one who is the master over that weather. God, forgive me. And Romans 8 says, the whole creation eagerly waits in expectation for its redemption and has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. I don't know about you, but I've been noticing in the weather and all the patterns and stuff like that, man, there's a lot of groaning going on. And this world is awaiting its redemption and we need to await it with the world. I want to tell you that only one who is master over all can redeem the creation. Over one who is head over everything can redeem us. And only the one who is Lord over all can bring the fullness of God to us. And there is only one really right response to a master. And it's not to resist him. It's not to, uh, to, uh, not, like, to hold back from him and not fully give ourselves. No, the only right response to a master is to submit to him, to give ourselves fully to him in every way. And that brings us to the last one. Through Christ, God dealt with our sin and gave us life. We just came through the Easter season. We just celebrated Good Friday and Easter in which we remember what God did by sending his son Jesus and what he did on the cross and how he rose again for, to new life. And I love how Paul puts it here in verses 13 to 15. He says, when you were dead in your sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with Christ, forgiving your sins, blotting out the handwriting of decrees that was against you and opposed to you. He took it away and nailed it to the cross and he disarmed powers and authorities, made a public spectacle of them and triumphed over them in the cross. I have some good news for you today and that is this, that your sins, which were literally trespasses, that means they were intrusions and infringements and invasions against God's holiness and righteousness. Like when you trespass in a place that's not yours, you are infringing on that place. Like God said to Moses, take your shoes off because this is holy ground. If you don't, you are trespassing. You are violating and intruding on me. God says to you, those sins that were formerly an infringement and an invasion against me and my holiness, I have dealt with them. I have taken care of them. I want to ask you a question today. Do you think that all of your sins are forgiven today? Or just the ones that you remembered to confess this morning or yesterday or whenever you last talked to God? I love what this says. God has forgiven all your sins. Thank you, Lord. He says the handwriting of decrees, the word is literally ordinances, laws, rules, regulations. That law of God that stood against us and was opposed to us. You see, God's law and regulations were a perfect standard of righteousness. They reflected his character and his holiness and no one could measure up to them except for one. And the reality is this, that the law brings to us the fact that we are deserving of death because we don't measure up to it. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But I want you to know today that just as we've celebrated in Easter, God did through Jesus what you and I could never do. He fulfilled his righteous laws and his decrees himself. The ones that stood opposed and condemned us because of our sin. The ones that reminded us of how guilty and how lowly we are and how unworthy we are. Those things, he took them away. He literally told them, took them out of the way. He said, move out of the way, you law, and let my children come to me. He nailed them to the cross and he said, never again will those get in your way. How many of you know your sin never needs to get in the way of your relationship with God? Because we have an advocate named Jesus who has already taken care of your sin. Does that mean we don't need to confess our sins? No, we do. But as soon as you do, 
Everything that God accomplished through Christ is applied instantly and permanently to your heart. All of your sin can be forgiven. Now, what about the powers and authorities that he's master of? Specifically, the evil spiritual forces that seek to deceive us and produce evil thoughts and words and actions in us to kill us and to destroy us. What did Jesus do about that? Well, guess what? God took care of that too. The enemy wants to kill you and destroy you, but God took care of that too. It says he disarmed those powers. He literally stripped them of their power. He made a public spectacle of them. It literally means he showed them up. He made a show of them. He said, ha, look at that. They have no power. And he triumphed over them in the cross. I want you to know today that God is victor over every power that can possibly come against your life. And if only more Christians would believe that truth, they would walk in that victory. He accomplished the redemption of humanity so we could be alive in him. Now I want to ask you a quick question that's going to lead us in our next part. It's this. Do you think today that it's a good thing to take full advantage of all that Jesus is and all that God has done through him? What do you think? God forbid if we don't. Do you think it's a good thing to pursue who he is and his wisdom and his knowledge and his fullness and his life for us? Well, that brings us to God's fullness in us. God's fullness in us. His fullness is not just for Jesus. It wasn't just in Jesus. His fullness is meant to be something that's in us. And I have a few things to give you today. The first is this. Receive the riches of knowing Christ. Verses two and three says that you may have all the riches of the full understanding, of the full assurance of understanding in order that you may fully know the mystery of God and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The reality is this, God's fullness is in Christ and it says there all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ and I wanna tell you why that is. It is so that you may have those riches. It's so that you may possess and own the riches that come from the understanding he gives and so that you can be assured of that and of your salvation and that you can know fully know the mystery of God and of Christ. It's like this, everything God was in Christ, everything that he did and he was and he is, his fullness, is something we can experience. And the riches of that, once we understand and are assured of it, come from what? One thing, knowing Jesus more and more. That's the secret. That's everything right there in a nutshell. The more you know Jesus, the more you know God's fullness. The more you know Jesus, the richer your life is meant to be. The more full it's meant to be. Philippians chapter three, I love how Paul put it there. He said, I want to know Christ. Want to know. Not just need to know, not just have to know, but want to know Christ. In the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings becoming like him. Paul talks about a mystery here. The word is literally secret. That which was hidden, but now is revealed. And how is it revealed to us? Is it because we're smart enough? We finally figure it out? We get intelligent enough? Is it that we're, we're so, you know, um, we're so experienced in our faith? We finally get so spiritually smart? Listen to what 1 Corinthians 2 says. What we've received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God, so we can understand what God's given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. We have the mind of Christ. It does not say we have finally gotten there, or we finally figured it out. It says we have received. There's a big difference. It's not about figuring it out, It's about welcoming it in. It's not about attaining it, it's about obtaining it. It's not about seeing it, it's about recognizing it. It's not about learning it, it's about knowing it. It's not about analyzing it, it's about receiving it. God wants you to know Christ and receive all the riches that come with that. Then there's a warning, number two. Paul says, don't be deceived. 
He says, I say this so, so that no one may deceive you with fine sounding arguments. The, the word is literally beguile or mislead or delude you. There's a lot of enticing words today. It's not only possible to be deceived today, but it's very easy to be deceived today. It's because many, many people who profess to be believers are not grounded in Christ and disciplined in their lives and truly steadfast in their faith. He actually refers to that in verse five. He says, I delight to see how disciplined you are and how steadfast your faith in Christ is. This is so key to prevent being deceived by teaching or doctrine that's not based on God's truth that's found in scripture. I'm telling you right now, friends, with all my heart, that if you are not disciplined in your spiritual life, then your faith will not be steadfast, and it is only likely a matter of time before you are deceived and misled and deluded into believing something that's based on lies. And that's the sad reality. Take heed to that warning today. In verse eight, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the principles of this world rather than on Christ. You see, this is talking about useless deception that will not change your life for God's purposes. It doesn't, uh, like there are, there are some uh, very prominent ones that are in society today and unfortunately have crept into the church. Let me give a couple of them to you. How about, it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you have, you can live how you want and do what you want and still have faith in God. You can still tell the odd white lie or have sex with your girlfriend or get a little too drunk or maybe gossip about people as long as you still have your faith. How about another one that says you can pick and choose which parts of God's truth you'll accept and which parts you'll ignore. You know, maybe we can ignore the part where it says Jesus says you must be willing to give up everything or give of your finances to his church or give of your time to meet the needs of others. God will somehow overlook this and you'll still turn out all right. Friends, those are deceptions that can ruin your life. And it says here that those things can actually carry you away as a captive. So it comes down to the source of it. Where does it come from? Does it come from Jesus? Does it come from his word? Or does it come from our thinking and the thinking of this world? We can prevent it from happening by giving our attention to it and doing whatever it takes. And that's a key to, a key to it is this next point. Number three, walk and grow in Christ. He says here, just as you've received Jesus, continue to live your lives in him or to walk in him being rooted and built up and strengthened in your faith and overflowing with thankfulness. You see, the reality is this. Once we receive Jesus, then we have this, this mandate, as it were, to walk in it. And, and it, the word walk speaks of movement. How many of you know you need to never stop growing, right? Never stop learning, never stop moving. And if you're willing to keep moving and go somewhere and follow and be led by him, then you will be, as Paul says, rooted and built up in Christ and continually strengthened in your faith. And, and those are key to not being deceived and experiencing the life that God has for us. You see, people don't realize how dangerous it is to be complacent and just coast and not give full attention to their spiritual life and their relationship with God. And before they know it, there are many, many things that are lacking in their life and they're experiencing the opposite of God's fullness. Well, I wanna tell you today, the byproduct of all this is thankfulness. And people will be able to tell by the thankfulness in your life that you have the fullness of God in you. And that leads us to number four, live in the fullness of God. I'm so glad that the fullness of God was in Jesus, that's what verse nine says, and in verse 10 says, in Christ you are brought to fullness. Here's a powerful truth, friends. Because all the fullness of God lives in Christ, then when we are in Christ and Christ lives in us, all the fullness of God lives in us and we can experience his fullness. It actually says there we are made full. Again, it's not something we do, it's something he does. He pours out of his abundance into us. Now remember what the word fullness means. It speaks of richness and completeness and abundance and wholeness. I wanna tell you today, that's what God has for you in every way. I love one of Gateway's theme verses from the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10, which says, I have come that you might have what? Life, and that you might have it abundantly or to the full. 
I want to ask you today, are you being brought to that fullness? Are you being filled up and made full? Are you experiencing the abundant life that comes from living in the fullness of God in Christ, or do you desperately need that today? I'm not going to give too much away from the next chapter of Colossians, but I will mention something that Paul says in one verse in Colossians 3. He says, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I hope that's encouraging to you today. Number five, he says, die to flesh and rise in faith. In him you were circumcised, not with a circumcision performed by human hands, but by putting off the body of sinful flesh, you were buried with him in baptism and you were raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. He talks about a cutting away. He uses circumcision as, a, as an illustration to cut away and put off sinful desires that cause us to sin. And we can receive the riches of knowing Christ. We can see to it that we're not deceived. We can walk and grow in Christ and we can live in the fullness of God. But you and I both know that day in and day out in the daily grind of life, it comes down to this, dying to ourselves and our sinful desires, saying no to me and denying the sins of the flesh so that they are buried as Jesus was buried in the tomb. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter four. He talks about baptism here, which is a picture of death and burial and resurrection and new life that only comes through faith in God's working just as God raised Jesus from the dead. And I, I wanna encourage you today, it is not death that God wants to leave you in. He wants you to die to yourself and give your old nature to him. But he raised Jesus from the dead so that he could too raise you on a daily basis from out of that sin, out of that mire, out of that which holds you back, out of that bondage into the freedom and the victory that he has. And if you will just see God working in you, you will experience everything that he has for you today. And that leads us to number six the last one, and that is to live in God's forgiveness and his victory. He says in the last three verses that we looked at today, when you were dead in sin, in your sin, God made you alive together with Christ, triumphing over them in the cross. I am so thankful today that through the cross of Jesus, God not only led to the resurrection of Christ and to our resurrection, but then he made us victors together with him. He triumphed. Now we, all, we already looked at the fact that through Christ God forgave our sins and he blotted out the requirements that was against us. But he didn't stop there. And we cannot stop there either. How many of you know that even though Jesus accomplished everything through the cross, how many of you know that God did not stop with the cross, right? There is more than a cross. As we celebrated at Easter, there's an empty tomb. And, and the, the good news of that is while we were dead in our sins and our sinful nature, we were headed for death and destruction. He, through his fullness in Christ that is made available to us, made us alive together in Christ. God has done so much for us forgiving our sins, making us alive in Christ, triumphing over all in the cross. But friends, we gotta live in that victory. We have to live in that forgiveness. If, if you can remind yourself on a daily basis that you are forgiven by God and that you are victorious through the name of Jesus Christ, how will your life be different this week? Living lives that are holy and devoted to God and experiencing his victory in every single part of our lives. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. As we bring this to a close, as we celebrate and respond and worship, there's just a couple more encouraging words of scripture I want to leave you with. Romans chapter eight, Paul says this, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Say those three words. We are what? More than conquerors. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory. I want to encourage you today that no matter what you've been experiencing lately, you do not need to be a victim of your circumstances or of your sin or of anything else that the enemy would bring against you. The fullness of God that was in Christ is the fullness that he desires for you to experience on a daily basis. And it's all because of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are Lord of all today. Mm. 
Amazing, eh, how that song ends with exactly what our theme is. Jesus, Lord of all. I want to encourage you today as you go from this place to know that as the image of God is seen in Jesus, also the fullness of God which is in Jesus dwells in you and you can know and live and experience the fullness of God in every way of your life. As we step out in faith and live in that fullness, we can experience everything he has for us as an answer to any lack or, or emptiness or hollowness that we might ever experience, including purposelessness. I believe that God's purposes and his plans can be shown and revealed and laid out before us and we can apprehend those and walk in them. I encourage you to be blessed today and to know that God's purposes and plans for you are good and they're awesome. Amen? So walk in God's fullness today. God bless you and have a wonderful day.